Welcome to the Sense and Sustainability Podcast, a program devoted to bringing people from diverse disciplines together to share their expertise and passion for sustainable development. If you'd like more information about us or our guests, you can visit our website at senseandsustainability.net, where you will find previous podcast episodes as well as our latest publications. Thanks for tuning in. I'm back with Jessica Yellen, former Chief White House Correspondent for CNN and currently a fellow at the USC Annenberg School of Communication. Jessica, I think it's safe to say uh, that you're an inspiration for many, many aspiring young professionals, men and that's women alike. That's safe to say? Okay. I think that's safe <laughs> to say. I mean, do you know, do you know when you Google, I'm sure you Google your name uh, very infrequently, but when you do, the the second line is... Elle Magazine calls her one of the most influential women in Washington. I don't know if you're aware of that. That's that's a pretty cool tagline. That was when I got to do a photo shoot for that. That was uh, one of the more fun moments in my journalism career. <laughs> Something that was actually glamorous. Right. I'm like the <laughs> right. daily grind of being a TV journalist is like, okay, so I've interrupted you, yes? No, no, no. That's uh, <laughs> you get You get to say that being a journalist is not necessarily... Uh, lead to being on the the front cover of L all the time anyway. It's not glamorous, right. I'll tell you that. Uh, less people get that impression. So actually, that's a good segue um, into my first question, which is, you know, thinking back on your life before your illustrious career in journalism, back to your college self, uh, if you could give that, say, 20-year-old, 21-year-old self of yours one piece of advice, what would that be? Ask for what you want. So which I actually did. Um, I, the most helpful thing I ever did for myself was focus on what I wanted and communicate that to people regularly. And what I mean by that is after college, not when I was in college, but after college, I decided that I wanted to be chief white house correspondent for a major national network. Mm -hmm. And I then ended up going into local news shooting as a one man band reporter, shooting my own stuff, covering um, traffic pileups and snakes in the backyard and murders and mayhem. And then I worked the overnights for years, uh, meaning I went into work at 10 p.m., worked all night and left at, you know, six, seven or eight in the morning. I um, got to the national network at Good Morning America and covered tabloid crime stories. So I really paid my dues. But at each juncture, whenever I'd meet with a boss or somebody who had some ability to shape my career, I'd say to them, I want to be White House correspondent. And they'd say, that's super cute. That's funny. Here, go cover this murder trial. And I'd say, yes, I'm going to do it. And I would do the work. But then when I'd come back and we'd do the assessment, how did it go? I'd say, I'd like to be White House correspondent. Mm, I see. And so it was in everybody's head and they'd laugh about it. Um, And then one day I was covering the Michael Jackson trial for ABC News, Good Morning America, and the White House correspondent at ABC News, I mean, for Good Morning America, got promoted to weekend anchor and they didn't have somebody to fill in. And the executives were like, well, Jessica is dying to get to the White House. Let's (laughs) let her do it for two weeks. No way. I did not know that about your career. So I ended up at the White House for, quote, two weeks. Under the with the understanding that this is not going to last, you are just filling in. Right. We're looking for someone else. And two weeks became five months. And then I finally got the job. And then I got the CNN job. And so, you know, what happened for me is I was clear about what I wanted, but I also did the work they asked me to do, which was not the stuff that I was choosing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a mistake to do only one, to insist that you only do what you want. Because you have to show you're a hard worker and you're a team player. But that doesn't mean you can't communicate your your needs and goals. Yeah. So could you tell us a little bit about how you came to decide on that goal? Boy, now that is an, a more complicated question. I always wanted to be a politician or I thought I did. I, I wanted to be a politician or a writer. And um, I went to work in the Clinton White House when I graduated college. Like that was my first job. And I watched how it worked and I thought, and I watched the TV news, you know, people who were on TV news. And at that point it was really just CNN, which was on, on a television in every room in the white house. 
And there are two things that could st- silence, you know, the work in the White House. One was the president walking in. Yeah. The other was CNN reporting on the White House. And I just saw how much power they had. And I thought, as a member of the press, I could have more power to influence policy and expose what's happening to real people and highlight the important stories than I do as a policy, you know, advisor. And I had this idea that if I were in the news business, I would cover the more serious stories and what matters more than the rhetoric and gossipy BS. I think you said the agenda, kind of. That's what I thought. Cut to, cut to me covering the rhetoric, gossipy and uh, <laughs> hence my reconsideration of my life's ambition. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, leave it to me to open those Pandora's boxes, right? We, we'll, we'll close that one for now. Maybe we'll get back to that if we have time. It, um, so you mentioned be a team player, right? Being willing to be a team player in addition to having a clear, clear goal. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the work by Daniel Goldman. He's the author of multiple intelligences and social intelligence and whatnot. But he, he's this professor who argues that, you know, in the 21st century workplace, EQ, social intelligence, matters, matters way more than IQ. Um, in your experience, what's, what is the role of, you know, being a socially minded, highly socially intelligent team player, uh, at least in your line of work? For reporters, I think it's vital because you have to constantly, I mean, the job is about relationships. You know, you have to build relationships to get information and you have to convey your information in a winning way to get viewers, right? So uh, having EQ as a reporter, I think, is non-negotiable. That's vital. I do, though, think that there's this other phenomenon and... I call it the Asperger's effect. Okay. I know and love people with Asperger's, so I mean it not in a... Right. uh, Descriptively, uh, not normatively. Descriptively, there you go. Thank you. Uh, But I do think that there is this, for lack of a better way to say it, there is this way in which people who aren't stopped by social niceties, who are willing to call 17 times and run up to the person in the middle of their dinner and ask for information or ask for a job, the person who is most willing to be aggressive in their own um, advocacy is often the person who succeeds. Really? And maybe I haven't watched it long enough and they, you know, get hurt over time. But there is a way in which being um, sort of tone deaf to other people's responses and not having that antenna helps you promote yourself. And I know that that works in Washington, at least. Interesting. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is that depressing? No, no. I mean, it's probably <laughs> descriptively true, as you said. I mean, I, I see that uh, in other fields that I can tangentially dip my toe into uh, as well. And part of me wants to believe that, you know, that's not sustainable. Um, right. That there is some reckoning to be had. But hey, I don't know. I don't know. I just know the number of times, you know, I've tried to reach a source and then I find out that their wife's just had a baby or they've just, you know, had the baby or whatever it is. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to bother them this weekend. And somebody else has been phone banking them obsessively and gets the info. I think it's safe to say once again here that uh, you are a better person for that. I'm sure, Jessica. At least I can go to sleep feeling okay about myself. Thank you. And and sleep is is pretty important uh, (laughs) in the grand scheme of things. Let me transition a little bit. Where do you turn for inspiration? Say, what do, who are your top three favorite authors or artists or thinkers, people? So Joan Didion, just because I think she's one of these writers. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to write now. So I'm reading a lot. And I've loved Joan Didion since I was in junior high. And she's able to convey uh, mood and an intimate moment with such precision and simplicity. I just think she's genius. Mm-hmm. Um, Tom Wolf, I read a lot. I read Bonfire of the Vanities over and over like it's a Bible because he has managed to tell this sort of gripping, juicy story, but that has actually a, a social, it's a social commentary and it's powerful. Um, and he makes it seem effortless. And 
this is going to shock you. In the uh, broadcast realm, mm -hmm. I think that Ryan Seacrest is a rock star. He is the single best broadcaster of our generation. And it's not because he's ubiquitous. It's because he has this ability to relate to people and talk about issues even that matter to him and that matter to, you know, I mean, obesity is a big issue for him. And and he does it in this really casual, positive way where it doesn't feel holier than thou. It feels just important. And he tosses it off. He is a good person to study about how to be at ease on air. Hmm. Um, and fourth person is Gloria Borger. And this might sound a little convenient, uh, but she was my colleague at CNN and a pundit political analyst. And when she came to work at CNN, I was already there covering Congress. And so was Dana Bash. And Gloria called and said, hi, I'm coming to work there. I want to introduce myself and I hope we can all work together and I'm excited for it. And Gloria proceeded to do exactly what women mentors uh, one imagines they would do, but rarely do, which is uh, reach out to other women mm -hmm. and provide advice and encouragement and support unsolicited and deal with not all, not just all women, but younger women too, in a way where she was completely unthreatened and supportive. She's the only person I know who did it that thoroughly. And I, I learned from that and want to be like that. That's a ringing endorsement. For Gloria, yeah. Yeah. But no, we can, awesome. we can admire our friends, right? I mean, nothing <laughs> right? wrong with that. So actually, you, you keep beating me to the punch and, and in the process, helping me not have to come up with segues. Because the next question I was going to ask you has to do with women in the workplace. Um, you know, any general advice you might have for women, yes. right, who are looking at careers, especially in careers that are, you know, typically thought of as being high intensity, um, journalism being case in point, I would think. So the advice I'd give is try to build alliances with other women. That doesn't mean don't build alliances with men and, you know, men can be wonderful supports and mentors, et cetera. But one thing that men in the workplace have learned to do is to be one another's backup in a way that women, I don't think women do it sufficiently uh, and, have, and are actually scared of it. Um, and I found what happens for women is sometimes you see a friend of yours get a promotion or get an opportunity. And immediately the thought is not, I resent her for getting that, but I'm falling behind I'm not good enough. It's somehow another woman's success is somehow a reflection on oneself for women. And if you can stop that thinking and say, actually, it's great for her. It means more opportunity for all of us and try to reach out to them. Uh, you'll find that having a network of supporters like that helps everybody. And I've seen guys do it. Some guys have done it with for me. But when I've been able to do it with other women, it gives you that much more support and creates a happier workplace. So it's sort of modeling the behavior yourself that you would like to see from others kind of creates this change around you that becomes really effective. And the men benefit, too, because then they see, you know, everybody's getting along. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I would not pretend that everything's cool in the workplace there. It's it's still tough there. It's still tough there for the chicks. But, you know. We know what we're doing. Yeah. No, that's, that's valuable advice, I'm sure. Okay, let me, let me get you out on these two. Um, yeah. Zooming out, 30,000 feet. Right? What most worries you about the state of the world today? And what most excites you about the state of the world today? Oh, that's interesting. Those are good questions. You're good at this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, they're closely related. The thing that most worries me is the apathy, uh, the sense that... Um, powerful connected interests have so much control that I as an individual can't do anything. And so I should just fill in the blank, play video games, right, go watch Lord of the know. Rings. Or, yeah, Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the thing that most excites me is honestly seeing all these Americans in the streets protesting peacefully against uh, the, you know, the deaths that we've seen in uh, you know, for the hands of the police, right. Ferguson and, and Long Island. It doesn't even matter that, you know, where they stand politically on these issues. I am so happy to see Americans caring enough about an in issue to protest. And this is, you know, something I think the rest of the world has on us in America 
In Europe, there are protests all the time. In Asia, you see it. Uh, you know, wherever there's like an inch of freedom, a tiny bit of oxygen, people are out shouting about what they think should change. And in America, we have so much, you know, opportunity and freedom. We just have this weird tradition where we're reluctant to protest. And I'm really glad to see that we're tapping into the spirit of protest and speaking up. And that gives me a lot of hope for the future. Well, I like that. That was nice. But to your last point, it's sort of like, I don't know, I see this every time I go back to Korea. Yeah. In the US, we've got like everyone and their mom has a front lawn. So grass, like green grass, nothing new. We're used to that. But in Korea, it's so rare to see like nice lawns. That I think people, like, you can't find a spot on any of the public lawns in, in Seoul ever because it's just, like, people love it. So to your point about any, any breathing space for democracy to sort of come in. Right. Um, we have it in abundance, so yes. we don't exercise it. it. It doesn't feel as precious, and so we don't exercise it. It's, like, the same reason people don't vote in vast numbers. Well, you know you always can, right. so you don't have to. <laughs> right. But if they threaten to take it away from you, then it would become valuable. So you know, we're, we're finally starting to turn the corner, hopefully. Green grass for everyone. Yes, greener grass <laughs> for everyone. Um, Jessica, thank you so much for being on the program. My guest today has been Jessica Yellen. Thanks for having me. This is a treat. Thank you for listening to the SNS podcast. Have any thoughts on today's episode and want to join the conversation? Find us on Twitter and Facebook. And as always, visit our website at senseandsustainability.net for more information.